uh, New York Times Magazine was a great article by Mark Bittman on pears. And he had 10 different recipes for pear salad, pear salsa, and so forth. But he talked about, uh, he put a, a name to what I've been doing for a long time. It's called a jar vinaigrette. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that. So first things first. Um, I talk to audiences with different demographics. I, I can tell you. I'll bet every one of you in the room, I'll just ask, has a chef's knife like this, right, of some kind? Right. How many of you have sharpened it in the last year? Cleaver. Okay, you have a cleaver. Have you sharpened it in the last year? Good. All right, one other. And, and so we've got a couple of folks that have sharpened the knife in the last year. But just, I'll, I'll make a plea for one thing. If you have to stab a tomato and then kind of <laughs> saw away at it, it could be that your knife is not sharp enough. You know, it's like people will not drive their Prius with only five pounds of air in the tires, right? You put 36 pounds of air or whatever. Uh, if, you have, if you have a knife at home, my advice that will change your life, and I'm serious about this, is to, is, is to sharpen your knife. Now, a lot of people say, but it's way too complicated. you got to take it in to the butcher shop at Andronico's and pick it up on Thursday. you got to go through all this drill. It doesn't have to be that hard. You don't have to buy a $110 sharpener. You can get a $7 sharpener at Ikea. Someone can give you a gift like this. This one's too fancy. It's got three things, and it also says, is your knife European or Asian? <laughs> you know, so now, now that's getting way too complicated. I like to keep things simple. Just get yourself a cheap knife sharpener, uh, take a couple of swipes through it like so, and you'll be surprised how that right there will bring back the joy in cooking. Why don't you go ahead and sharpen this one? Use the middle. We had the sharpener at the North Berkeley Farmers Market, so you can put your knives in the middle. Yeah. yeah, there you go. See, that's great. And and for folks that, I mean, see, are you kidding me? We're, we're, I don't have a dishwasher, so I don't have to worry about it. You know, I don't put them in the dishwasher either, but even not, I mean, we never put our knives in the dishwasher in my house, but they still, it absolutely makes a difference to sharpen them, okay, and, and to the, the fine tuning is, of course, the long steel, you know, the long rod you all have in your little wooden block for your knives, that fine tunes the knives, but that's kind of like eyeliner and stuff like that after the foundation. This is, <laughs> I'm not sure how all that works, but, but this is, this is the basic. The next thing I learned was I used to hold a knife back here, or I used to hold it like this with the finger out on top. I learned from my son, who uh, became a chef after, after college, to just, he puts his thumb and his forefinger on the knife blade like this, tucks the fingers in behind, try that, Michelle. And then it, it, it gives you a nice motion and it makes it kind of nice and stable. So the first thing we're going to do is, what's life without garlic, right? Uh, we're going to make a little vinaigrette, and now let me, let me show you a trick. Um, see the stem end right here? You don't want that in your teeth. You don't have to peel it yet. Cut, cut the stem end off. Hold your knife like I showed you. Just cut the stem end off, sweep it off to the side. Cool. All right. Now take the flat of your blade like this and give it a little bit of a whack. You hear the cracking sound? Nice and easy pick the skin up and it just jumps off. So now, there's nothing wrong with using a garlic press, but the skin gets stuck down there. You gotta dig it out with a toothpick or a paring knife and it kinda gets caught. And the next time you try and use it, you can't squeeze the garlic through because the skins are all dried in there. So I, I like to keep it easy. Um, when I learned to do surgery 40 years ago, there were some surgeons that used three different kinds of blades, four different kinds of scissors, five different kinds of sutures, it made everything look complicated and they kind of furrowed their brow and looked intense. And then there were other surgeons that just used one kind of everything and kept it nice and easy. And the patients did just fine six weeks later. Everybody was the same. So I learned a long time ago, keep it simple. This is simple. We got a knife, use it. Now just go ahead and use your knife to just mince the garlic a little bit. And just mince it up into little small pieces. Now again, these pieces are too big to go into a dressing. So sweep them up into a little pile machine. That's good. That looks good. And now we're going to macerate the garlic. I don't know if any of you do this when you're making a dressing, but we're going to take a little kosher salt. And we're going to put a little salt. Oh, 
that's a lot. Like I said before, this isn't packaged and processed foods. So we'll just sweep some of that away. That was excessive. Um, but the salt works as an abrasive, and you can take the edge of your knife, put the edge of your blade right on the edge, like this, the other end of the blade. Now put your three fingers right there, put it right on the edge of the garlic, put your three fingers down, push hard, and squash it. And then you kind of pull the garlic toward you, and that macerates it, it turns it into a paste. And just in seconds, you're able to go back and forth, and you end up with a garlic puree. Mm -hmm. That way. Now, if you're going to make it, you no, know, but this is a good. It's a good simple trick. And if you're going to make a dressing, then this way you don't have chunks. So now this is the jar dressing. We're just going to put. Actually, did it. <laughs> that's beautiful. We're just to sweep it off to the side for now. We'll clean okay. up later. So we're just going to use a little bit of garlic, and then Mark Bittman's article talks about a basic ratio of olive oil to vinegar and whether it's red wine vinegar, balsamic vinegar, raspberry vinegar, white wine vinegar, sherry vinegar, a basic three to one, three times as much oil to one of vinegar. Now you can measure it out and I think if you go into the Shape and East cookbook it's one and five seventeenths something. It's a little bit, it's, you know, it's a little bit fancy. So I just dump a little bit in there. Um, we're not going to make much dressing because we're just going to make a salad for two here in a second. So we'll just let that sit for a little while. We're going to let the garlic and the, the salt just kind of dissolve. Now the next thing we're going to do for the salad is to take some corn. This is grown in organic corn grown by Allard Family Farms and I bought this uh, uh, eight hours ago. So now take, hold this. Notice I made a flat part. Uh, one of the safety rules in the kitchen is if you have something round, make part of it flat. It keeps it from rolling around because if a vegetable rolls around, uh, you know, it's, it's more of a risk that your knife is going to slide off, particularly if it's dull. That's why a sharp knife is safer because a sharp knife goes into things, it doesn't slide off of things. So go ahead and hold your knife and just cut some kernels off into the pie plate. I'm afraid you were going to make, make me do this. No, that's good. <laughs> Don't worry about it. That's great. I used to cut corn off the cob. I mean, I always used to think you had to cook it. Um, you know, bake it, broil it, grill it, uh, steam it. And then it was always, well, do you keep it simmering? Do you put it in a pan of hot water and cover it and shut off the heat for five minutes? There was all this drill. And then I discovered that the simplest thing is you just eat good fresh corn eat it raw. And it tastes just great. It's a lot simpler. Do it in a pie plate or a big, you know, your basic Heath salad bowl, you know, your nice big flat salad bowl. Uh, keeps the kernels from jumping all over the, uh, from jumping all over the kitchen. Now the next step for this salad is we're going to take a red onion. And um, I look at an onion as kind of like a head. And this is kind of the hair on top. So I'll cut this off at the neck. Using, using the theory that if it's round, make a flat part. And then there are terms that interventional radiologists use. <laughs> and one of those is called a coronal section. And that just means you cut straight down like that through the head. So go ahead and peel. Now notice I only cut one, half of the, one end of the onion off. I didn't cut off both. And that was for a purpose. If, um, if you cut off both ends of the onion, Slice it up because you, then you're going to dice it. The slices will scatter around your cutting board. You've got to chase them all down, and it takes a week to dice up an onion that way. <laughs> so I like to just take one end of the onion off and leave the other end intact. Now put it down in this kind of an angle, and then watch real carefully. This is an important point. What we're going to do here is what's called the radiologist we call sagittal sections. Notice, notice I'm coming. Go ahead and try this machine. I'm not going all the way only through, to the only to, like, to the middle. And just straight down. Cool. And you can make these little slices that I'm doing, these little vertical slices, you can make them wider or narrower. Uh, never once has anybody complained about how wide or narrow my dice are. I mean, it just doesn't matter. Just, just do that. Make the little slices all the way down to the cutting board. Cool. Now turn it this way. And now you just cut down, it was called the axial section. 
and you can see that it's just that easy. You get a nicely diced onion, uh, nice and simple. And we're just going to scatter in a little bit of diced red onion there. That, that's cool. That's plenty. Just put in a tiny little bit in there. We don't need too much. And sweep the extras off to the side. Okay, let's um, we'll clean up the mess a little bit later. This is this is a little bit exactly. She's got it. Save it for soup. Indeed, uh, one of the best things to do when you're cooking is to take scraps like parsley scraps and onion pieces and things like that. Put it into a two-gallon freezer bag. Freeze it. Someday, when you know when you're just hanging out, fill it up in a stock pot with 10, 12 cups of water. Simmer it for a couple hours. Strain it. You've got a vegetable stock that is seasonal. You know where the ingredients came from. You may even know the farmer who grew it. And you've got a stock that doesn't that does not have 960 milligrams of sodium for every cup of stock, and it costs you no money. Um, so let's take a pepper, nice organic uh, sweet bell pepper. Um, I used to just cut them in half and then kind of niggle the seeds out and do all that. Well, I was watching a, a, an actual chef is cut off the top and the bottom and then stand it up again under the theory that part of this is flat. Uh, you just cut down on each side and the seeds all just stay right in the center. Mm. Okay, so that's a nice easy way. There are other ways to do it too, but now just go ahead and slice this. You can stack them if you want to save time. And we're just going to make some little... That's, that's all there is to it. Red pepper's done. And um, I think we're good. Let's just move on to cilantro. Um, fresh cilantro, you know, like parsley, if you're using a bunch of parsley, you only want the leaves, not the stems. And, you know, you can take a good sharp knife and like a razor cut you would get, I guess, that's to call it at the salon. You can kind of go like this and the leaves will come off on the parsley and the stems will stay behind. With cilantro, you can eat the stems. So I just, uh, I mean, I don't worry about stems. Uh, with cilantro, I just take a bunch of it and mince it up and then sweep yours into the salad. Here. And again, none of this ever has to be perfect. You know, if you're at a fancy restaurant, the mincing is going to be perfect. There are going to be little tiny grains of something green scattered around the edge in a swirly pattern. Uh, I don't do that. <laughs> I'm just, you know, over making a mess. I mean, the nice thing when you've got a real kitchen counter, you kind of clean up as you go. Um, that we're not going to be able to do tonight. But um, why don't we finish this vinaigrette for a second? And uh, we'll just take some extra virgin olive oil. And, Sean, let's just do that's about one and a half to one. That's about three to one. Okay, that's it rather than measuring with tablespoons, since you're going to taste it anyway, uh, just go ahead and give it a try. And this is what Bittman would call his jar vinaigrette. I mean, you just put it in the jar, shake it up. Now, I am going to add a little Dijon. If you just have oil and vinegar and you leave that in your refrigerator, the oil and the vinegar is going to separate. If you add Dijon mustard to it a little bit, it's an emulsifier, and it keeps the oil and the vinegar together. So let's just put in a little bit of Dijon, and if the Dijon is too, got too much bite for you, you can add a little honey or agave nectar or a little bit of sugar. You can uh, balance it out, and when you're cooking at home and nobody's watching, the way you would test your dressing is stick your finger in it. <laughs> if you have company over, uh, you have to use a vegetable. Okay, so that's what we're going to try here. Go ahead and taste it. We need pepper and a little more salt. But it's basic. You can change this up with lemon juice, balsamic vinegar, leave out the Dijon, do various things. Read Mark Pittman's article, it's great. There's a bunch of vinaigrette recipes too on my blog, but it's in the recipe card that you get. Vinaigrettes are, the, I mean, like for that Faro salad I was talking about, a Meyer lemon vinaigrette is spectacular on that. A vinaigrette like this, uh, tonight, I mean, we just made it before coming over, a pear salad. Took a fresh organic Comey's pear, 
chop it up into little chunks, mix it with some butter lettuce, some other things. If we'd had blue cheese, I'd put that on it. But, but this vinaigrette is perfect with a pear salad. Just It's uh, sweet and tasty, and pears, even when they're not totally ripe, they're crunchy and sweet. It's just a beautiful time of year. Bittman does a really good job telling us why pears are so good. So we got our vinaigrette made. Now the last step for this salad are cherry tomatoes. And you know, um, this is a great season. I guess it's kind of the end of it. We're getting to the end of cherry tomato season. But if you have, um, if you got cherry tomatoes and you have a lot of time to cook, it's possible to cut each one of these cherry tomatoes in half. And it can take you kind of a while. Now watch carefully here. Let's move this over to the side. What Michonne's going to do is take this lid, turn it upside down, put it on top of the tomatoes, and hold it with your left hand gently. Then she can take this knife, sharp, and bend down. Okay, cut. Go. Just go, 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 go. Look at this, folks. Look at this. All right. There you go. Yeah, Is that perfect or what? <laughs> so that is the magic cherry tomato trick. <laughs> and you can take that home and wow your friends and your family with the magic cherry tomato trick. And this works for grapes, it works for olives, it's, uh, you know, it's real, real handy. That's so smart. Um, and that was, uh, you know, how it is that at a certain age you start learning more from your kids than you're teaching them. Well, that one came from my son, and it's really, really been a handy uh, trick. I love the cherry tomato trick. So let's just mix this up, and, uh, oops, see what you think. It smells really good. There you go, help yourself. Let's just test it out here. Sharp knife, a couple of cutting boards, salad spinner, change your life. Any questions? Mm -hmm. I love the tomato. Yeah. That's, That's the best. That's a great question. Yeah. Some of those tomato techniques that you use, I demonstrate on any of your you videos. Do it. Yes, and just, I mean, um, just for fun, I did five or six videos with recipes, then I did another 15 of them with just the techniques for garlic, for how to get the pit out of an avocado. You know, and of course that one, of course, when I was banging the pit trying to get it off the knife, it jumped off and rolled on the floor. But uh, the cherry tomatoes, other things, they're all in those little videos I did. Um, it was just kind of on a lark. We did it just with a couple people at work. We just kind of did it and posted them. And, and I was surprised to find out that as of a month ago, there was like 120,000 views on YouTube. <laughs> I'm thinking, who's got the time <laughs> to sit there and watch an aging, you know, gynecologist do videos. Uh, I, I don't quite understand it, but but there's some fun there's some fun tricks here. Yes, ma'am. Would you tell us the avocado seed secret? <laughs> yeah. Well, this one um, this one's kind of cool. You just you slice the avocado uh, lengthwise all the way around, twist it. One half will have that pit that's stuck in there. That's slippery as hell, and it's stuck in there tight. When you take your your knife and you go like this and just do a 90 degree turn and lift and it'll come right out. Very easy. How do you get the seed off your knife then? Well, you, you bang it on the edge of a bowl. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's the trick. And then uh, a lot of people will then take a sharp knife and go and, try and slice the avocado or wedge it this way before they scoop it out. What I like to do is to take a soup spoon and just scoop out the whole half. I put the half down and just make some cuts on the bias, and then you can kind of fan it out and, and kind of marvel at what you created. <laughs> <laughs> That's the fun of it. Yes, sir. Have you developed any secrets for mangoes? Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, the most impressed I ever was with mangoes was watching a woman by a subway stop in, uh, in New York City. She was uh, passing out mangoes to people, uh, you know, and, and I was just amazed. I haven't figured that one out yet. They're pretty slippery and uh, no, I have to study up on mangoes. <laughs> Anything else? Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate you uh, coming out tonight with all these other events going on in town. It's uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to share uh, kind of what we what we do at Kaiser Permanente. Uh, I work with a lot of good people. I mean, you know, our markets are not just at our hospitals now around the country. There are like 50 other hospital systems that now have markets. 
But um, I also am privileged to work with people, uh, to know people like a woman named Ruth Conley, um, who is the director, recently retired director of the Watts Learning and Counseling Center. It's a Kaiser Permanente Community Benefit Program in South Central LA that was started right after the riots in 67. And that center will do uh, preschool, after school, family counseling, SAT tutoring and stuff for any kid in the community, Kaiser or not. And Ruth Conley went out and got five other community groups to work with her. She started a market in the Ted Watkins Community Park uh, in a neighborhood uh, with no grocery stores. And there are 20 vendors there now every Saturday morning for the last five years. There's a mariachi band, a petting zoo, and the people in Watts have a place to buy fruits and vegetables. So, uh, you know, so when I get to work with people like that, I always appreciate being able to come and, and kind of share some of the stories. So thanks again for coming up. Thank you. Yeah. Sanitizer, some blue season, and then we've provided some information on the